Good evening, and welcome once again to Slush Heap. Um, I don't know what episode it is. doesn't make a difference. The series we're working on is how to write a book. And tonight, uh, we're going to talk a lot about um, making the right publishing decisions. We've gone through everything else. You know, how, put the, how to put a pen to paper, you know, how to get somebody to um, critique it for you and make little black marks all over the place and all that. We've covered all that. So tonight we're ready for publishing. And we have some fantastic guests on. Um, actually, all of them here have been here once before. And, you know, that tells you something when we bring somebody back because they have so much to tell us that you can't get it in on one show. And <laughs> this is the place. This is the way to do it. So, Darcy, I'm going to let you have the honor, since you're the beauty in this thing, to introduce our guests for the night. All right. Well, Your welcome voice to, is better. <laughs> welcome to Slush Sheet. Um, as Rudy said, we're on the How to Write Your Book series for Season 4, and we've brought in three people who have written at least one book, um, along with Harlan, our resident friend of the show. And um, they're going to tell us a little bit about publishing, and actually... Well, let me introduce Alana first. Alana Terry has written several books, and she has a sequel coming out in the well, fall, early winter um, to her probably most popular book, The Beloved Daughter. And welcome, Alana. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit here. And seated next to her is Charles Grove, and he is um, with HWP Books. And Charles, you're going to tell us a little bit, but you actually do some publishing through your company, correct? Uh, we have five books out right now. By the end of the year, it'll be 12. Excellent. So okay. so Charles can really help us on that side of the publishing, whereas the others can sort of tell us the decisions that they had to make during the process. Uh, seated beside him is our Swiss friend, Katie Hayos. Katie's been with us several times because we like to keep her up in the middle of the night. Um, it's more <laughs> 1 o'clock her time, right? 1 o'clock? Yeah. So, oh. you know... We appreciate her coffee drinking very, very much. <laughs> and that's that's according to her Swiss watch. Yes. <laughs> Not the Swiss cheese, the Swiss watch. <laughs> and of course, Harlan. And Harlan, how many books do you have out now? Five. Five books out. So um, he's been through this a few times himself. So between the lot of us, we should be able to uh, touch on several topics that um, are of interest when you're working towards publishing. As always, we've allowed the question and answer um, app to, to work so that if you have any questions during the show, you can write them in and we'll see them and try our best to get them answered live for you. If not, if we happen to miss one, we always take the time after the show to make sure that we get back to you. So with that, Rudy... As always, the bus is coming. I hear it. And I'm throwing you right out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I'm looking at our guests tonight, and we really have um, not just people that have a lot of knowledge in, you know, this publishing end of it, but they're in all different phases of it. Um, we have um, Harlan, who I believe he self, you know, self-publishing is the way to go. Please correct me, Harlan, if I'm wrong, but I think everything that you publish goes through your hands only. That's I right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, Alana, on the other hand, uh, her publishing, um, I would assume, is done through a, a, a publishing house, but it's not the, your standard run-of-the-mill one because your books are what we would consider Christian books, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Some I've got a kid series that's through a real small press, okay. and then my Christian fiction I self-publish. You self-publish. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, and 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 Charles, um, you as you said already, you have you know your own publishing, and uh, it sounds like you know when you if you're jumping from five to twelve in a short time, you're well on your way. And I'm gonna I really want to hear what you had to do. Because you were an author first, right, Charles? Well, I was a journalist first. Oh, okay, and sorry. Then sorry. Then an author and then a publisher, with editing thrown okay. in the middle of that, too. Okay, great, great. Um, and then, uh, Katie, uh, who published your book? The, um, I'm 
uh, uh, Untethered was an agent-assisted self-publishing. Okay. And right now, my agent has my next manuscript, and I'm attempting, I'm attempting traditional publishing. Uh, if okay. Uh, the publishing choice here, though, the, the word choice is not really <laughs> a choice because I'm at the mercy of whether the publishers want to choose my book or not. Um, so we'll see. we'll see. Well, there's a there's a good point we can actually start with, and I like the way you put that, the fact that you're at the mercy of the publishers. That's what I think any of us, as soon as we hear the word publisher, you know, there are certain uh, words that publishers, um, is, they have their own vocabulary. And one of them, of course, helped us out because they have the slush pile, mm -hmm. which created and turned the slush heap, you know. Uh, kind of a pun for us, you know, that's fine. But the whole thing is, yes, we are at their mercy because, you know, first of all, unless you have a, an agent, your chances of publishing through a standard publishing house are almost nil. Am I wrong or on that or does anybody I think, wanna... I think you're right I think you're right and I think and having gone through the experience of having an agent and I and I and I have a well-known agent from a, with a well-known agency even having an agent <laughs> it's not easy to get picked up by a traditional publisher um, okay. so I think there's you know in terms of when you talk about traditional publishing it, it's you really have to have a thick skin and you really have to want it and keep going for it, or else you want, you have to be willing to work at self-publishing, um, and then you don't have to, to to deal with all of that. But um, you have not only do you have the barrier of trying to find an agent, and then after the agent, you you know your agent then has to get you into the door with the publisher as well. So. Um, yeah, because with my first with my first novel, my agent thought it would sell no problem, and it didn't. It didn't, which is why we went we went to self publishing. So, Katie, Katie, in the in the past episode, you had brought up the fact that um, the reason why your agent thought it was going to sell well is because of the genre it was, and at the time that was a pretty popular genre. Um, but right. then the market ended up getting flooded. So, is that generally the case if you're not writing like what's trending at the time they're not your your chances are nil I don't know if they're nil but I can tell you that what I what I sent her this time um, she read it and she wrote back and she said she really liked it and she said but I want to warn you <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> that right now um, anything fantasy Paranormal is still not what publishers are are going after, and it might be a tough sell. And I think it's I think there are trends, but you know, but then there are books that still get through that. So I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's just that somebody had a great day and they just fell in love with a particular book, or or you know what it is that makes those books get through when a lot of other really good books don't. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But there are well, definitely trends. There are definitely certainly trends. Certainly your genre, your genre is well received in the um, movie industry. You know, and you would take it it takes a book, it takes a script, so you would think that they would go after that. But again, remember they're in the driver's seat. And I, what what you said earlier, I just you know, I, I make myself little notes. So what you're actually telling us also is a failure is not an option then. That's the attitude you have to take. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, but I think that that's also why um, self-publishing is so exciting and and popular because you don't, you know, you can go right from I've done this to putting it out there. the The problem is, you know, you do need to kind of know what you're doing to if you really want to be successful at it. And I can tell you that I am an unorganized person. <laughs> And self-publishing for me has just been kind of like a nightmare um, because I'm so poorly organized and, and spread thin. But I think that um, in writing, if you're a writer in general, failure can't be an option. Okay. Right? I mean, any anyone who's who's written something it should not be. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, it, so, so Katie, one more write, question. I'm Actually, oh, I'm sorry. hold on. Can, can okay. I? Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, okay. 
The first book I published of mine, my third novel, the first two will never see the light of day. I think failure has to be an option for a writer. You have to accept that some of the stuff you write doesn't deserve somebody's time or money. And you have to be, especially in self-publishing, responsible enough to say, this is something I shouldn't make somebody else pay me for. This is not something that somebody else should spend time on. But and I don't so call I that failure. I wouldn't call that failure. I would call that um, I would call that a learning curve and experience and also just being smart about what you're doing. I guess for me when I say failure, I mean giving up completely is what I mean by failure. In that case, I agree with you. Absolutely. So Katie, before actually I want to ask Charles a question, but before I do, Katie, do you want to say who your agent is for those who are <laughs> looking? <laughs> I kept Jane Distel at Distel and Goderich. Um, okay. She's, she's, she's a, you know, she's been really helpful with my last manuscript. Um, and please, please, I hope she finds somebody for it. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, Katie, type it into chat and we'll share it with, with the audience so they can, fi they can find this agency. <laughs> Well, they should be able to find out to figure out how to use chat, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'll get it from you later. <laughs> so, Charles, I want to come to you. How, uh, so, Katie's talked a little bit about traditional publishers and sort of, you know, like these decisions that they have to make. Um, how do you differ from that? How does how does oh, your company differ from that? Well, small presses is very different in a lot of ways. First of all. Traditional publishing has shrunk. There's very few traditional publishers out there anymore because they've all merged. So right. you're not dealing with this field of 100, 200, 400 companies. You're dealing with these very stratified, very large-scale companies. And what you find is that there are sub-brands in there, like, for example, Bain Books, Tor, which are not separate publishers. They're sub-brands. They operate a lot more like I operate where you can actually get to somebody, you can make a decision, you can actually connect with somebody. Those little places in traditional pub are a lot like me. The okay. place where, where small pub is different compared to Simon & Schuster, Hatchet, Random House, when you, when you talk the bigger main brand names, is, once again, you're going to reach an actual person. When I work with an author, it's a personal decision for me to spend time on that author. It's a much more community-oriented behavior. It's not a dollars and cents budget line situation. Uh, when we do the anthologies that we do, and we, we did our first anthology, we had 15 people writing in that anthology. Uh, the second and third had 10 each. The one that's about to come out in the middle of June, Real World and Real, has got uh, 13 authors on it. Okay. Now, I'm doing line editing, developmental editing, mentoring and coaching with all of those people, and I'm not charging them what a line editor, a developmental editor, or a mentor or coach would charge them. So right. the disadvantage you get when you go from self-pub to small press is you lose some control. But if you go to a small press that's a properly functioning small press, you get support, you get help working through your work, and the thing that's kind of unique about us is you can't do multi-author anthology self-pub. By definition, once you've got multiple authors involved, you're a press. You're either a communal project type press or you're a small press. You're now an organization. You now have to have rules to work amongst your authors. And one of the great benefits people get working with me is we have a hell of a good author list. And we put people into what we call cross critique. So you don't just get my feedback. You get the feedback of the other people that are going to be in the book with you. You get a chance to say, hey, wait a second about a story before it ends up sitting next to yours. And that's something that you don't get at Simon & Schuster. You don't get that at Random House. They're not going to say, you guys are all going to be in the same book. Here's an opportunity to speak out about the quality of each other's work and give each other some help. You're not going to get that kind of connection. Okay, so I have two follow-up questions to that then. The first question is, when going to a small press, is um, can a person expect it to be sort of like a traditional press in that, you know, people think traditional press, I'm going to get money up front, and then I'm going to lose a portion of the sale price. Is that how it works with a small press, or how does a small press work? Very rarely. Uh, and for what it's worth, that's starting to become very rare in traditional also. Traditional's gotten to the point where there's not a lot of money up front, 
and they've started playing bookkeeping tricks so that if you get money up front, it's probably the only money you will ever see, no matter how popular the book is. Okay. This is why when Katie was talking about an agent, agents are really useful if you're going to go to a traditional press because it's really, really easy to get a $3,000 advance and get $4,000 worth of charge notices against it and be told you're lucky they're not taking money from you. That's starting to happen to a lot of authors now. So okay. with small press, my contract is two pages long. I actually put it out in a public forum where people can discuss it and decide the merits of it publicly and see other people's opinions of it before it goes out. That's not what you're going to see in large publishing. So I understand you have to give stuff away to be in small press, that you're not getting what you get from self-pub. I want to make sure that I give as much balance as possible. That doesn't mean every small press runs the way that I do. Some of them might be better than me. Some of them might be worse than me. Okay. Excellent. So then my, my other follow-up question is actually about an article that I read today. I, I, it might have been published yesterday, but I was just happening upon it today about Hatchet and Amazon. So apparently, for those who didn't read the story, tr traditional publishers are having trouble with Amazon because Amazon is trying to do what a lot of big, basically, box stores try to do, which is negotiate price. And so what ends up happening is this book doesn't come on the market until five weeks, five months after it's finished, after the books are in hand and ready to be sold. That's it. So is that something that small press runs into at all? We're not running into it, but there's another thing you got to remember. Amazon's got another issue there. Amazon is a publisher. Right. And anybody who forgets that is making a, a tactical error. Uh, they don't mind my being out there because I'm little. I only give them money. They, it, it, it costs them basically nothing to put my stuff up on a server. If it doesn't sell, they don't care. If it sells, they make money off of it. With the big press, they're actually competing with these guys. They're going to start competing for authors. They started doing things like Amazon Worlds. They want to throw traditional publishing out and take its place. They want that percentage of the business. And if they successfully do that, then people like me might have a problem. As long as there's still a tension between those traditional publishers and Amazon, as long as there's still Barnes & Noble, there's still Kobold, there's still alternatives, People like me will have a place where we can work. And same thing, by the way, with self-publish. Because if we go away in small press, self-publish is probably going away at the same time. Okay, excellent. So, Alana, coming to you, you mentioned that one of your series, the children's series, is published by a small house. And then you are actually, you've decided to do the, the well, Beloved Daughter's already out, and then the sequel on your own. Is there a reason why you decided to go that route? With Beloved Daughter, it was kind of what happens. I think a lot of self-published authors start in this way. You know, they do the look for the agent, look for the publishing house. And so I spent a good three years trying to get it published and didn't get any um, any hits. And then it was a finalist in a contest that I had submitted it to which gave me at least a little bit of confidence say okay well publishers haven't been interested but maybe it it is merit worthy and so beloved daughter I published self-published because I didn't feel I had any other options but really am thankful for that since then um, I've gotten offers to sign on with agents and, and with publishing companies and have turned them down I really like the freedom that comes with self-publishing um, kind of like Katie said it's a headache at times there's a lot of logistical things to keep track of that might be nice not to keep track of um, but I really do appreciate being able to do it myself and the independence that comes from that and then my children's books series um, is by a real small press kind of doing like what Charles is doing she's got a niche market push, putting out fiction for homeschooled kids so the idea is to have books about homeschoolers for homeschoolers to read just so they don't have to always be reading about stories that take place in public school settings and it's been a good experience working with her too because a lot of the upfront things that I've had to work on with my novels <clears throat> I haven't had to worry about she does the editing she pays for the formatting and um, you know copy edits their illustrations for each chapter that I didn't have to pay for or worry about um, so I appreciated that side of it too so that's a good point. So aside from, obviously, there's going to be a, a monetary difference when you sell a book as an indie author versus going through a small press or a traditional press, um, what other aspects of control do you maintain as an indie author? 
I think the biggest one for me is being able to control the price. Um, some of my biggest success um, selling wise have been doing things like 99 cent sales or things like that where you know if you're with a real big house you don't have any say in that whatsoever and so that's probably in my opinion the the biggest benefits of going self-pub is being able to um, control the price. Some of it has to do with how long it takes to get a book out. Um, I was fortunate to be able to publish The Beloved Daughter within a month or two after Kim Jong-il died. And since the book is set in North Korea and since that escalated a whole bunch of um, tensions and it was during the you know nuclear threats to North Korea was kind of the top news story timing wise it worked out really well whereas with your when you're with a real big house you know it's by the time you sign it can be over a year until the book comes out which is one reason why I didn't end up going there's there was an agent who approached me who wanted um, to promote my second book that's coming out but you know, I'm hoping for it to come out in the next few months and it would take her a good year to year and a half to pitch and then another year to year and a half for the publisher to sell and I just figured I would lose any momentum I've gained in that point and it didn't seem worth it. That's a good point. What about you Katie? Is there anything that you fear now that you're considering you know, the more traditional route? Well I have to say uh, it's funny because the um, the same thing with, with Untethered, which is one of the reasons I decided to self-publish is because it won it it won second prize in in a contest and I thought, okay, that you know, maybe publishers don't know what they're talking about. This is still a decent <laughs> book and blah 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 blah. Um all the, you know. And one thing that I really, really like about self publishing is the that control and um, the fact that you can get it out there and do what you want with it. I'm not particularly talented at that. Um, so my, I'm extremely impatient with this whole pitching and then whatever happens next. I mean, it's been going on. The book has been done since December, and uh, you know, I'm I'm just I'm writing other other books, but I, I'm chomping at the bit because I would really like to just put it out there and, and what have you. And fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have a huge momentum that I'm going to lose if I don't publish something right away, right now. I think if, if my first book had been some you know, major hit on Amazon or whatever, I probably wouldn't have even gone trying the traditional route because you know uh, there's so many satisfying things about self-publishing in terms of you know you controlling like like Alana said the prices and you you control the cover you control the content you control there's a lot that you do control but um, I, you know uh, for me it hasn't been um, a success in terms of uh, feeling like I'm going to be giving up a fan base if they have to wait a year for my next novel. Maybe I have eight followers or something like that. So <laughs> <laughs> all my slush heap friends. <laughs> We're following, and I read your first I'm book, saying, so I'm kind of sitting over here thinking. Well, <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. You know. <laughs> So, Charles, one of the things, one of the other things that I've heard several people mention about traditional houses that makes them nervous is the handing over of the book and losing a lot of their voice when it's edited and cut and reworked. Um, is that something that they would worry about with a small house or small uh, it press? It depends on the small press. I can speak for mine. Um, our procedure when we're doing, for example, the anthologies is we will do an initial pass and we've rejected stories. This is not, you know, oh, if you're in, you're in. It's we've rejected stories. We will work with people to put an alternate story in its place or to reinforce the story they have. And we have sometimes made cuts and just said it's not going to make it. Uh, once the story makes it past initial edits, we put it into cross critique and you get to sit with all the other people. And that's the wonderful thing about the internet. You get to sit with all the other people who are in that store in that volume and talk to each other and you get to see other people's opinions, not just the editor. It's not a one-on-one -on -one situation anymore. 
Now it's other people who are your peers whose stories were good enough to get into the same no into the same book. That gives you another level of feedback. Once you flip through there, then there is a final edit. And the only thing the authors don't have control over is that final edit. But by the time we get there, it's 99% line edit. It's I'm correcting the spelling on words. Uh, or one of the other editors I'm working with is making those kind of corrections. It's not story content because that would have happened on first or second pass. So the way we work, you have tremendous control. Um, we're doing a, a solo anthology right now for Mike Reeves McMillan, um, phenomenal author. And what we did there is he and the editor are working one-on-one. -on -one. He's seeing all of the revisions as they're happening. They're doing this collaborative document. And then I'm going to come back in and do a second edit to do final line edits when he's all done. So I can't speak for anybody else, but we give the authors a tremendous amount of opportunity to retain their voice. We think that's what's valuable about our authors. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you this. Oh, I'm sorry, Rudy. Go ahead. Well, no, to, to continue on that one, I, ha I guess the question I have, our audience, uh, I'm, I'm sure, is wondering, um, we, we've talked about traditional publishers, and we talked about um, uh, small publishing houses like yourself, yourself, Charles, and then we have talked about self-publishing. Now, if the traditional publisher has, um, and let's say they go through the whole alphabet, A through Z, they do everything, from the time you hand them a manuscript, you basically are done as a, as a writer. No. In, in a traditional house? At every level right now, traditional, small press or self-pub, you have a lot of responsibility if you're on marketing. So yes, you hand over the book, you oh. lose control of the book, but you <laughs> yeah. still have work okay. on the back end. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, so Wait, because that was what I was going to say. Correct, but no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Now, in your particular case, the small, um, how much of it uh, do you, by the time they hand you the book, do you actually, in the end, hand them the finished product? So okay, do you well, print? We, we only, we're only doing print as a, a marketing strategy. We're really ebook. We've done a limited print run here and there okay. to do marketing, but we're ebooks. Okay. Um, That's what I was so, trying to make. Because that hasn't been mentioned yet, so I wanted to make sure. And that's great. I mean, the, everything else you said, um, you know, uh, and, and that's important to, to people that take that time to write a book, that they have a little bit of control. At least they feel they have a little bit of control. And what you said so far, you know, I would not hesitate to go to somebody like you now for my next book and say, okay, what do we do from here? Because you basically you do the editing, you your the group does the critiquing, you know all that stuff. Where before, as a self publisher, I had to look for all these people, and boy, if you uh, go through everybody, you have to look for. If you make one mistake in one person, it can be damaging to you financially. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there, there's, there's basically, to my mind, eight cost points, and you guys can jump in if I miss one. There's writing, and even if you're the writer, your time is worth something, so it's a cost point. There's writing, there's line editing, there's developmental editing, there is the cover. Can I say that again? The cover. Really important that you get that right. Okay? There is the cost of an ISBN number. There is the cost of layout. Even if you're doing all these jobs, your time has value. So that's six of them right there. The seventh one that you've got is marketing. And regardless, once again, whatever level you're at, traditional pub, self-pub, uh, small press, you're responsible for some of your marketing. You have to be if you're going to be serious about this. And then that eighth cost is what people refer to as the Amazon tax. Okay. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, they are not charity institutions. They're going to take a percentage. Smashwords, whoever you're publishing through is going to want some cut of it for the part that they do as well. And what you want to do, self-pub, small pub, traditional pub, is you have to understand those costs and how much of that you can afford to bear to do the job right. Okay. That's a perfect point. So, so Harlan, when you're looking at all those points, um, you have gotten around this in your own way, <laughs> and you've gone complete, I mean, you're, you're an indie through and through, but you've decided basically to just take 
your own thing and make it your own thing through and through. You do every step of the process. Is there a reason why you decided to do that and as opposed to looking into any other avenue? Yeah. The reason is because my writing is mine and no one else gets to adjust it or uh, influence it at all. I do the line editing, I do the uh, developmental editing, I do all of that myself. I should be working for somebody who does that. <laughs> you should. And I have different, and I have different uh, purposes to my writing. I, I don't I don't want just praise for my writing. Oh, that was a good book. I wrote something, an excerpt, and one of the responses was, now you're making me cry. And I'm thinking, ah, that scene worked. So I've arrived at a point there, with that particular scene anyway, to make it effective. I'm more interested in the craft. I, I'm not so interested in the money. I don't... I could use the money, but I don't need the money. I'm not desperate for it. I'm used to living like a street person who happens to have an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all the, the rest of the stuff with the agent and, and the editing and all that, I, I suppose there are writers, there must be, who need that kind of looking after. And I don't need that. I don't even want it. If I screw something up bad, I'll, I'll hear about it in one way or another. But I'm more interested in refining the craft of writing. I want the paragraphs, the scenes, the dialogue, I want them to be successful. And at this point, everything I've written, I feel is successful. I don't want the opinions of other writers. I want the opinions of people who are not writers. The other writers aren't buying my books. It's the people who are not writers who are buying the books. They want to be amused. They want to be entertained. They want a page to go by where there's a, a constant state of realization happening as the story unfolds to them. That's the craft that I'm interested in achieving. I want to be a craftsman, not just a storyteller or or an indie who puts things out without any second thought and then worries, oh, will the cover be okay? Is the opening okay? I know the opening's okay. And as far as I'm concerned, my covers are fine. I'm satisfied with them. I wrote something this morning on, on Google about covers. I, I'm not going to repeat any of it now because I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, a cover has, has a function and, I, and I'm thinking that one of the most important parts of a cover is having a, a teaser or a hook written on the cover something that will make the person looking at the cover or reading it question it or maybe generate some interest in it and if, if the, the cover fits the story <coughs> the chances are it fits much better after you read the story. You say, ah, the cover makes sense now. Mm -hmm. the, the cover doesn't make any sense when you buy the book. Got to have a hook, either illustrated or written, on the front of the book, one or more. Ask a question or, or set up a dangerous aspect of, of, of the, the entire plot. But give them something that, that'll to read or see that will generate an interest. And, and, I, and I would say even, you know, um, uh, how do I want to say, it's it, putting emotion into it before you've even opened that first page. I know, Alana, you actually, I received them on Facebook and stuff, you actually sent out different cover options and asked some of your friends to, to choose between the ones that you were considering. And right. um, I would say they were all emotive in a different way. I mean, it, it, can you tell a little bit about why you did that and you know how you reached out to people and yeah I had a really hard time so my second novel that will be coming out this fall is called Slave Again and the protagonist in it is a really hardened character she escapes a North Korean prison camp and ends up getting trafficked over the border into China and has to um, kind of fight her way back to earn her freedom back and she's a very tough survivor character 
And so I was looking to try to find pictures of, you know, tough survivor women. And first, there weren't very many. Um, you know, they want the pretty, sweet, you know, sexy, sultry models. And none of those seems to fit. And so I found a couple. Um, but, you know, Darcy, the ones that I put up, I ended up not going with those because I got enough people. I found two that I thought were at least somewhat representative of the character in my mind. Right. And I put them up. And, you know, some people, especially who oh. read The Beloved Daughter and knew this character, had, um, you know, opinions about what they preferred. But I got a lot of people, especially from people who hadn't read any of my books yet, who said, frankly, I don't like either of them and I wouldn't even pick up this book. You know, they look angry. They look mean. Um, so I actually switched and I found one that was a softer look because I think, like Harlan said, you want, or, or maybe it was you, Darcy, I forget, but you want that evocative sense and that emotive sense. And um, So yeah, I did choose to go with something that looked a little more inviting to pick up, not like you'd pick up this book and the character's going to bite your hand <laughs> when you touch the cover. <laughs> So. No, I know what you mean. And actually, I think that Charles made a really good point earlier when you were saying, Charles, that you know the cover really means a lot. So in your small press, do you have a lot of say, or does the author really maintain that say as to what the cover looks like, or how does that work? Well, we've a, until we do the one with Mike Reeves, McMillan, which we're doing right now, this will be the first time there will only be one author involved. Okay. Uh, what we've traditionally done with the anthologies is we've picked out either one or two stories, taken a core element from that, given that to the artist, given the artist a copy of the story or stories. And by the way, when I say artist, I mean Aaron Wood. I mean Juan Ochoa. We're about to do a project with uh, Sam Hunt. These are phenomenal people. I mean, take notes. These are three names you guys should be talking to if you're talking about covers. Very different styles, very different approaches, all of them brilliant. Uh, I know Aaron's been on the show, um, but uh, what we'll do is we'll pick something out and we'll say, here are the guys that are going to be on there. Uh, for one of them, we're actually working from a photograph that haunted me so badly that it became the reason we did the theme and the reason I did the story that's in there. It's the only time I'm actually giving myself the cover. I probably won't do that again for another two years at least. Um, but generally speaking, it's working from giving the artist the actual stories and saying, here's the section we're thinking about and letting the artists, just like we let the authors have their input, letting the artists have their input into the creative process so they're proud of the results as well. That's excellent. And the nice part about doing that is, um, especially if you pick people like Aaron Wood, I mean, I don't know the other two you mentioned, and I actually want to get the third name from you later because I only caught two of them, but... Um, the nice part about having someone like Aaron Wood is he has a huge following and there's one more person that can promote your book, mm -hmm. which I think is something to look into as an author is um, how much are these other people going to put into, you know, getting that exposure. Is that one of the things that you've considered as your hiring artists? It, it, it's had a little bit of an effect, but I'm actually, at the end of the day, much more concerned of ending up with a product that we're proud of than ending up with an immediate uptake. I believe if you put things out there that are good, they'll catch eventually. Right, exactly. Like, you know, if you go for that quick, that's what's killing traditional publishing right now. It's, oh, this person's running for president. Let's take their ghost-written book and splash it everywhere because we don't care about quality. We care about topicality. That that's a lot of what traditional pubs in trouble right now. They gave up their curation. They stopped being responsible for what they put out. So so point. to me, yes, Aaron having the following is important to me, but it's much more important that he's Aaron Wood and he's that good. Right, and that's a good point. So Rudy, though, if I were to say, and I don't mean to discount anyone else, but if I were to say, if you were to look at a cover of a book and buy it off the shelf, there's probably one of our guests that stands out above all the rest. And I'm willing to bet you know who that is. <laughs> and okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. If you know who it is, I was just wondering if you know. But her books have sold, I would say, because of the cover. You know, because yes. of the covers on them. Yes. And yes. It, and they're stunning. And that's something yes. as an author that you kind of you know I've seen a lot of authors overlook. I guess I should say. But I think that you all make a really great point. Is that that cover design is really what's you know, what people are going to see first. Yeah, we, we had a whole show on that, and, you know, we, we had the differences of opinion, but uh, I do believe, like you do, that a book can sell a, I mean, a cover can sell a book, absolutely, oh, yeah. you know, and I know you're talking about Joe Marshall, 
I am. <laughs> Her, it, the artwork is absolutely oh, the, the artwork is, 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 I mean, you, you cannot put that down. You cannot pick it up and not open it up while you're standing in the bookstore. It's impossible. And I think then once you start reading the words that are associated with the illustrations, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You know, so yes, the, the cover does make a difference. Um, the other one that I would have picked if it wasn't her was the um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Is that what it was called? No, uh, Bohemian Love Diaries by Love Diaries. Coleman. Okay, yes. Yeah. That, that cover just, I mean, it makes you look at it and say, what in the world could be behind <laughs> these pages? So you have to, you have to take it. Yeah. No. So right now, I I agree with Charles. I mean, I mean, I believe that the cover is everything, and um, you know, we've been through this. We've been yeah. through two covers, and actually, the funny part is, the the cover that I chose as the writer was actually something that has to do with this, the story in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, is it is it enough to sell it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I you know, and again. Yeah, Go Katie, ahead. I was going to actually bring you up because you actually ended up changing the cover of yours. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. But and but I think that um, if we're talking about publishing choices, I think this is co a cover. Uh, you know, all these eight points that Charles was talking about, and a cover being one of them, is uh, unless you know someone or you have experience in design, you're going to have to hire somebody to do that if you're self-publishing. And I think you know. One of the one of the reasons that I'm attempting traditional publishing right now is I just don't <laughs> I don't have any more cash and you know and that's the thing and I don't and I think part of the problem with possibly with some uh, of the Swiss some Swiss. other self published books <laughs> is that is that you know the covers don't do the books justice because people don't have the money necessarily. To pay someone for a, for a good cover, and the same thing that you know, I think if um, I think what uh, Harlan was saying, I, I, it really touched me in terms of you know craft, and I think as writers, the craft comes first, and that's something in the publishing industry, self-publishing and traditional publishing. I feel like it's being forgotten. It's all let's get more out, let's get more out, let's get it out quicker, let's get it out faster. Um, so we can make more cash, and nobody and, and quality doesn't count as much. And um, I think that's why you know, right now you know, if you really want something to look professional, which is nice with a small publisher, you can have somebody pay for this kind of stuff. But if you can, if you can do it yourself, and if you can pay for it, that's great. That's great. Or if you find people who are willing to work uh, at a price. I think that there are there are a lot of really really great self-published books out there with fantastic covers, good formatting that look more professional than um, traditional published books. I agree, and actually, Alana and I were talking before the show started about another aspect not not the cover art but the editing and how expensive that can be. Now, on a former show that we actually had what two weeks ago, I guess um, we talked about editing and. Uh, the people that we were had as guests were talking about the cost that a traditional publisher would put into um, editing, and they estimated it could be anywhere from ten to a hundred thousand dollars for a book. Now, of course, as an indie author, the vast majority of us don't have ten yeah. to a hundred thousand dollars to put into the editing of our book. So, Alana, you were talking about um, you know a sort of a different avenue that you took. Do you want to share that um, for the editing part? You mean yes. Yeah, so Beloved Daughter, um, my first one, I did pay for a professional, um, you know, I get the terms confused. Is it the copy editor that does just the typos, grammar, commas? Copy or line editor, yes. Okay. Um, so I did pay for that because I felt that that was the one thing I was going to miss the most. Um, but for the development and story editing and things like that, um, it just went through a lot of personal friends. Now at that point, I didn't have any budget to work with for my writing, and I didn't have any guarantee it was going to go anywhere, so I just took what I could. With the novel I'm working on now, 
um, I've had several author friends of mine and we'll swap beta reading kind of like the critique groups Charles was talking about but you know we're not publishing together it's just hey I've written this can you take a look at it and she'll say I've written this can you take a look at it and um, you know and so I sent out Slave Again's manuscripts to probably 10 different beta readers got back um, six out of the ten and some were just kind of you know I liked this part this is what I thought about that character a few paragraphs whereas other people actually went through found a bunch of typos I wouldn't have found um, found awkward wordings and things like that um, and then I also did hire one of my colleagues who's just a freelance editor to do some of my editing um, some of the story editing too but um, you know she's she's more of a friend and colleague so it's not quite the thousands and thousands of dollars you might think but um and then I do plan again when it comes time to publish I plan on getting the line editor just for the last of the typos because especially when you're self-published you gotta be so careful because if you have you know typos you're gonna really get blasted in the reviews and even I do it when I'm looking at you know ebooks to buy or something you know if there's enough reviews that say it's got really bad grammar or bad spelling I I usually don't bother with it especially if it you know it's just something I browsed upon and wasn't recommended so I do feel like that parts really important I do and I yeah and I like the fact that you've kind of um well, and what it is sort of what we talked about last time was that if you walk it through several steps before it gets to the editor, you're ultimately going to pay a lot less anyway because you've taken a lot of the editing work and, and already corrected that. So right. that's a good point. I really like that. So, so, so far, Charles, we've talked, uh, you know, basically touched on two of the points that you're talking about. Are there any of the other points that um, someone who's going to be an indie author can save on? I mean, because initially you before you started the publishing you were already an author how did you approach it? it I'm doing a, a project right now which I'll, I'll just plug very briefly and, and use as an example um, my wife's going through cancer right now well uh, she's finishing up chemotherapy and I made her a promise that I was going to write her a million words so I'm doing 30 30,000 word novellas all in the same series so that there's always a cliffhanger there's always something for her to read the next one on and I'm putting that every two months to the next five years. Uh, so I've put a phenomenal writing challenge in front of me in that way. And one of the things that I'm doing to cost contain the fact that I now have an obligation to 30 covers, to an editor editing 30 books in terms of line edits and uh, developmental edits and everything else is, and it's a lot of what Alana was saying, it's, it's applying the rigor yourself. Uh, to Harlan's point, I can do all the bases I don't feel comfortable being the last person to check me, which is a big part of why I do pay for editing, which is why I do pay for these other things. Um, but a big part of the cost containment is, as you were saying, is that ability to actually say, I'm going to make sure that I understand how this is going to work in ebook formatting if it's going to end up being an ebook. I understand what it's going to look like in print. Um, I do trial layouts on things, even if other people are laying them out. When I write magazine articles, I do trial layouts in a publishing program to make sure that I'm not creating a million word breaks. I look at how wide their columns are. So I'll look at what e-readers do. And if I'm a, an independent writer doing a project like this Tiago project where I'm going to put out 30 books, I'm going to start negotiating at the beginning and say, I'm not negotiating a book. I'm negotiating a set of books. And I use that as part of my hook in talking to the editors in talking to the artists and talking to each of the people. I'm not doing one project at a time. I'm saying, here's a set of things I want to do, let's be partners on it. And by doing that, even if I wasn't a small press, even if I was independent, I'm likely to get a better deal because this person knows there's going to be work and there's going to be more work and there's going to be more work after that that makes them more emotionally invested and it makes the pricing more reasonable. That's a good point. You know, and I feel like we should mention, because they've been on the show before, that there are other other options. We've touched on the traditional and the small press and then the indie author, but there's also now hybrid publishing, which is sort of combining that, you know, um, where they're saying, okay, we're going to, like, well, there's two different ways to look at this, but anyway, Book Trope is the one that I'm going to use as the example, where they're saying, okay, you come in and you have a lot of input into picking your team, and then you work together as a team, and everyone takes a small cut of it, as opposed to being it's not a small press or a traditional publisher. They're not taking over control of your book. You're still maintaining that. 
but you're not going to get the same amount of money after you've sold that book because you're going to share it with the editor who you didn't pay up front and the book designer who you didn't pay up front and the you know um, peer reviewers who you didn't you know give anything up front and each person is going to take a little bit of a cut but the nice part about that um, so the, you know there's the downside in that you're not going to get the same amount of money back on each sale the good part is of course that you're getting all those services and you're not killing your budget right up front and you also have a team who want to see the book do well who are going to help it do well so the, the emotional buy-in can't be underestimated right exactly and I, I, I think it's worth mentioning that that is another option for those who want to go that route there are certainly far more than book trope book trope is just the one that um, has been on the show before and I felt we should we should push that <laughs> for that reason but um, Rudy, we are we're right at the tail end of the show. Is there anything else that you wanted to ask before yes. we go ahead the and give one, everyone a minute? The one thing we have not touched on, and, and Charles, I want to start with you um, because um, um, I, I'm sitting here. We have not ta talked about what it is going to cost uh, a writer to come to you. What's he going to spend throughout that process until that book is on Amazon or wherever it goes to be, you know, to, well, to be uh, published. With the first anthology we did, we actually treated it very much as Darcy was describing. It was a hybrid situation, which okay. essentially meant that each author chipped in toward the cover and the interior artwork. Okay. So they paid in, I think it worked out to about 20 bucks a person. <laughs> okay. They had no other expenses. We absorbed every other the expense. Covers. These are the covers that you're talking about that are done by some very good artists. Phenomenal people. Yes. yes. Um, so to be clear, our normal policy is it doesn't cost the writer anything. Uh, we have in every one of our contracts a clause that says if we need to negotiate money up front with the, with the artist who's doing the cover or interior artwork, that the, the authors have an obligation to chip in up to 20 bucks. But that is the only thing we will ever charge anybody anything for, and that's not money I keep. 100% of whatever we end up collecting goes to the artist, and if we get the deal with the artist cheaper than that, the money goes back to the people who paid in. Okay. So we don't believe in charging people to be published. We believe they get published if their story is good enough. We have an obligation to the reader. Okay, excellent. So, Rudy, should we then go on and, and have everyone say their their Bit at the end now. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm gonna. It's interesting to see. No, don't forget to tell them. I mean, we do want them to plug themselves as right, well. Of course. Yeah. But uh, if there's anything that we missed that you've gone through, this is your opportunity to do freelance. You know, say what you want, but like I said, at the same time, don't cut yourself short. Um, we want to make sure that the, the people that are watching us, and and it's amazing how many people are starting to write to us. Asking us for um, opinions, not just what do I do here, but who do I take to do this for me, and that is really encouraging. I was talking to um, to uh, uh, Darcy earlier today about that, and I think tonight, I mean, I took better notes than I ever did because when people ask me this thing, who should I go to? Here, I should, I'm, I've written my third and fourth book. I'm not happy with doing it myself. Now we can actually make ourselves a little bit of a um, spot on our website where we can even say, hey, these are the people that we recommend that you try. And, and that's what the whole thing was all about from day one, is to get all that information out there without the people on the other side of that this show having to spend 12 hours to find out well, who is good and then just take some written you know, some place says, oh, they're good. But no, we know they're good because we've seen them. And Charles, you've seen what they do. And I've seen what, what um, Aaron Wood does. Oh, my God. You know, it's, it's, oh, yeah. They're good artists. So. No, that's a good point. So, yeah, so basically that's what Rudy's really saying is please take the time to promote yourself and what you do and what's coming up. But also, if we've missed anything in the publishing topic that you want to hit on or that you feel that people should know about, please do that as well. As always, I start with the first person on my screen. This could change during the live, or during, I'm sorry, in the archives. 
so you know don't get all suspect that I've thrown some in, in there I'm going by on my screen so Alana you're first and uh, yeah, have at it okay well I am I feel like we covered quite a bit you know if there were any plugs or recommendations it would just be to um, you know get involved there's a lot of especially if you're an indie author a lot of really neat indie author communities and forums and Facebook groups a lot of the beta readers and things that I've found have come through there um, so the more help you have in all of these areas um, I even had an author friend who was better skilled with a design program than I was who helped me touch up a cover photo and things um, and so you know I've been really blessed to be in a community where we kind of just help each other out like that and so um, I would just say yeah look for communities either you know self-published communities or communities in your genre and that could be a really neat way to go um, self plug um, I just want to throw out there um, so my novels, my Christian suspense novels are set in North Korea and I've recently teamed up with an organization called Liberty in North Korea which also goes by Link for short. Um, so if you're interested you can make a donation to um, a fundraiser to help rescue North Korean refugees and get a free book or audiobook. And the information for that is at um, alanaterry.com slash link, L-I-N-K if you wanted to check that out. Excellent. Thank you Alana. Thank and you. Charles, you're up next. Okay. Um, well, the next two things. Right now, we just put out uh, Tiago and the Masterless, which is part of my million word promise to my wife. Uh, it's science fiction adventure. It's fast. It's light. It's kind of Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Tom Swift taken just up a level in terms of they're not all taking place the same summer. The characters do grow. They do expand. The, the nature of the relationships change. Um, basic premise is we're following a guy who has escaped Earth having stolen their most advanced spaceship and is now slowly going mad because it's been two years since he's had contact with an actual person. And it's his attempt to find a society, any society, no matter how loosely you have to define society, to fit himself back in and be a person again. Um, you can find all of our books, by the way, at themethology.com, T-H-E-M-E dash T-H-O-L-O-G-Y dot com, uh, which is where most of our stuff is, is in the Themethology series. That's the other thing I want to plug, which is Themethology Real World Unreal, which is urban fantasy and other themes related to urban fantasy. Thirteen really phenomenal stories. I mean, I'm proud of every book we've done, but this is probably the place we've really hit stride and done the best work we've done as anthologists. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Charles, very much. And um, how do people get a hold of you if they're interested in publishing with you? Um, they can go to, they can email me at books at hdwpbooks.com. They can find me on Google Plus as Charles Baruch. Um, C-H-A-R-L-E-S, B-A-R-O-U-C-H, bar ouch, B-A-R-O-U-C-H. Um, find me either of those ways. I'm also on uh, Facebook. I'm under my real name everywhere. I'm on Twitter, so you can find me with that spelling pretty much anywhere. And I'm happy to talk to authors. I enjoy talking to authors, artists, editors. It's you know, what I enjoy doing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Katie, you're up. Um, I'm surprised it's already two in the morning. This went really quickly tonight. <laughs> it's just like, whoa! Time flies, time flies when you're having fun. I was really getting into it. Like, what? It's already over. Um, too bad. <laughs> we'll try harder next time. We'll shoot for 4 a.m. <laughs> um, I also think that'd be a great idea if you could compile, if Slush Sheep could compile a list of contacts that you've had on the show and, and resources, I think that would be fantastic because um, you've had some really, really interesting people on here and it would be nice to have that, you know, at the, just right at the ready. So that's a great idea, Rudy. Um, okay, thank you. The, the one thing I wanted to say about publishing is that, you know, I mean, I, I talked briefly about my own experience, but I have friends who, you know, who've gone, they're, they're happy in publishing in all its forms. You know, I have friends who've been with small publishers, friends who've been with vanity publishers, um, friends who self-published, and I think it just depends on, you know, what you want to get out of your, your writing and what you want to get out of 
your publishing experience, um, if you can, you can be happy no matter what you're doing. You know, as long as when you get into it, you know what you want, which I didn't. <laughs> it makes a difference. Um, but in terms of uh, a self plug, um, you know, just good vibes so that something happens with my next manuscript and the two ones that I have following that. Um, but I am going to be in an anthology that will be coming out in July um, called Celestial with a, a lot of indie authors. We're putting short stories together, young adult short stories all related to a comet, so it should be fun. It's just a fun project that um, that I think is really cool. So it'll be free, and we're just putting it out there to, uh, yeah, for fun. And you know, so um, there one of the authors is working on the co on the cover. The other one's organizing the whole thing. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. All right, Harlan. I'm working on a children's book. It's called The Children's Book for Rotten Little Kids. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. Yeah, I'm taking side notes. It'll be really for adults. <laughs> and my latest releases are uh, that summer, uh, all the venues, paperback and ebook, and a collection of 13 short stories called uh, Which is Which. Uh, to add more to the covers, I do my own covers as well. And my only expense for all five of my books has been five dollars. I have my covers converted to a PDF or a something or other so that the uh, publisher can use it, convert it to their whatever they use to produce the cover and a paperback. Uh, that's all I got going for me, except the pizza tonight. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting, though, that you bring that up. Five dollars. I mean, I think that one of the things that I fear about this show is that we bring on a lot of people who talk about all the expenses that can pile up, and we don't want to discourage authors. That's the last thing we want to do is discourage authors. We want to make sure that they realize that there's other avenues out there, because Hey, let's face it, most of us know firsthand what it's like to not really have the funds when you're going into it. And that's the whole thing. We're all trying to break into it and we're all facing, you know, the realization that there's expenses there that you're not expecting. So to know that it is possible if you're willing to put in all the hard work. Now let me state again, Rudy and I just had this conversation today. Not most authors are not Harlan. Harlan has an attention for detail that most authors would not have. I've read his book. There are very, very, very few, if I, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, uh, um, areas where he had a misprint or a grammar mistake or a misspelling or something like that. I don't think that most, are, most writers are like that. But if you want to put in the time and you have that sort of dedication, it's nice to know that that's an option, that you can, you can go out there and you can get your books out, out to market without you know, forking over huge amounts of money. So You can do your own photography as well if you have a chip in your camera. The book uh, I just released called That Summer is on the cover is a portrait shot that I took when I was a photographer of my daughter, one of my twin daughters. So that's her on the cover. And it's tinted blue and then the uh, copy is red so it'll stand out you know, in front of the blue. And I thought that cover worked out very well. And since the book is about a woman, you might get an idea that this is the woman that we're talking about. Very good. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Harlan. Right. So, Rudy, that leaves you. Thank you. Um, I, I was actually, um, the one thing I wanted to bring up real quick is two of our guests tonight um, I've kind of been in touch with the last two weeks, Alana being one of them. And she was writing her, her new novel, um, and she actually asked me at one point if I minded mind, uh, going through what she had written about one of the characters uh, who was suffering from PTSD. Uh, you know, it's a well-known thing that that's what I suffer from. I'm not just crazy. I have an excuse, <laughs> you know. So, but I, and, and, you know, when I didn't get it initially, uh, what do you do? You drop it and you, you know, but no. 
I said something to Alana and she sent it to me. And you know, it's funny. I read that and now I get a sense of what her writing is all about. And you know what? Uh, I, I would assume, Alana, you've never had PTSD. Correct. But uh, unless, unless you actually talk to somebody, you hit it right on the head. Uh, I mean, you hit that nail right on the head with what you're doing there. It's very brief, and that's the way it should be, you know, just to make sure you're trying to get it across. What makes this person tick? And let's face it, that's what makes that person tick. It was done very nicely. I haven't had a chance to write you back, but you will get it from me. <laughs> Thank you. appreciate that. Harlan, like me, went to uh, the Google Plus and had to say his two cents worth about Memorial Day, like I did. I wasn't so kind as he was, because there are people in this country who all they do is badmouth everything that happens. And um, I was just in the uh, grocery store the other day, and I was standing behind a young man with his son, and the lady that was checking him out said, excuse me, sir, can I ask you for a donation for the USO today? And, and I know that I've been through this before because they've been doing it for about a month. And as little as a dollar. And he looked her in the face and he said, why should I? No. And I mean, you know what? Like I said, I could have had an excuse. My excuse is I do have PTSD, which brings on some really strange moments, you know. But I let it go. Because it's just, you know, there are people like that there, and I had to write that on my, on my piece that, listen, um, you have the freedom because of the people that died for you, and you have the freedom to leave if you don't like it and find yourself a better place. And then I scroll down, and here is Harlan's writing, and it's one of his excerpts from one of his novels, and I read that, and I said, yeah, I even said today to uh, Darcy, this man... What comes out of his mouth is is got to be it's got to be actually created by a golden tongue. That's the only way I can put it. You know, because the words he puts together, I wish I could even speak. And I'm a, I'm a long talker, but not like that. You know? <laughs> I mean, what he did there, it didn't bring tears to my eyes. Don't get me wrong, but let me tell you something. It get put a smile on my face, and that's just as good. And Harlan, I gotta say, you know, I'm gonna assume that was your tenth draft. So if you tell me it's the first draft, I'm not gonna be on the show next week. <laughs> first draft. <laughs> so that's what I have to say for the night. There are people out there, and you know what, Charles, the way you the way you sound, I've never had the opportunity to read to read anything you did as a journalist, but I bet you um, you're in that same category. Just talking to you and listening to you, you're in that same category that seems to, you know, you know exactly which direction you want to go the moment you sit down. And well, there are seven go years ahead. worth of my business and technical articles at intl-spectrum.com. Have a look. Okay. So, Rudy, I think with that, you know, we will call it a show. I just want to remind people that we will be back next week. Um, we have our next in the series on how to write a book, and that is before you make your launch, what should you do in those days leading up to that final product being hitting the market. Um, and we are joined by two wonderful guests next week who are new to the show, Juliet Hill and Petamari Sheets will be joining us to talk about um, what you should be doing to prepare. Um, and I also would like to say on a personal note that my book is coming along much nice, much more quickly now. Thank you to Raymond Benson and Laurel Snyder, Snyder for giving me that boost. Um, we talked to them about outlining and in particular Raymond had a lot to say about how to use that to your advantage to move the story along faster. So I appreciate that very much, and I'm happy to report that that is finally gaining some ground. So with Yay. that, I want to thank everyone for being here again, and I hope you'll all come back to join us again in the future. Rudy, I'm saying good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Say good night, guys. <laughs> good night. <laughs>